the spring of 2017, my partner Carol and I embarked on a group tour of Greece with Go Ahead Tours. My only previous visit to Greece had been more than half a century ago as a 16-year-old hitchhiking and camping with several of my more adventurous classmates. Most tours of Athens and classical Greece follow the familiar circuit including the archaeological sites at Delphi, Olympia, Corinth, Mycenae, and Epidaurus, along with the hilltop monasteries in the Meteora region. In addition, ours included two nights on the northwestern island of Corfu, near the Albanian border. Greece has changed quite a bit in the intervening decades since I was last there, as have I. One of the first things that strikes any visitor to Athens is the profusion of graffiti, which building owners and public authorities appear to have long since given up trying to stop. Freely roaming dogs and cats were also in evidence wherever we went, though not in as great a profusion as in some other countries, such as Romania. Also noteworthy throughout the country is the large number of unfinished buildings. Greece is still struggling to recover from the worldwide recession of 2008. Numerous construction projects were abandoned and have simply lain idle for the past decade. Large stone structures like the Great Wall of China, the Egyptian pyramids or Mayan temples are the most dramatic and sometimes the principal remaining artifacts of these ancient civilizations. Early traces of our own Western cultural heritage can be found all along the Eastern Mediterranean Rim, especially in the remaining stone structures and archaeological sites throughout Israel, Greece, and Turkey. Drawing on the classical literary texts written here several thousand years ago, and with a lively imagination, we can begin to get a picture of the civilizations that once inhabited what are now often little more than piles of limestone rubble. All of these civilizations were multicultural and constantly changing as they frequently traded and fought with other nations. Perhaps more than any other country, Greece seems to be one huge archaeological site with piles of rubble scattered throughout the mainland and the hundreds of inhabited islands that comprise this beautiful country. Much of Greece looks like many other countries around the Mediterranean Rim. The fact that it is considered the cradle of Western civilization is not always visible to the casual visitor. A skillful guide is always helpful, as is some knowledge of European history, in order to properly understand Greece as the birthplace of democracy, Western philosophy, political science, the Olympic Games, mathematics, Western literature, and drama. Around 4,000 years ago, Greece became home to the first advanced civilizations in Europe. These were initially on the islands in the Aegean Sea. The Mycenaean civilization on the mainland developed an early form of Greek writing around 3,000 years ago. A few centuries later, the first Olympic Games were held in 776 BC. Around the same time, Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey now considered to be the foundational texts of Western literature. Throughout most of their history, the Greeks have been at war with their immediate neighbors, as well as in more distant lands. During the 5th century BC, Greek city-states fought each other, in addition to the Persian Empire, for decades. In the 4th century BC, Alexander the Great's short-lived empire extended throughout the entire Middle East all the way to India. The so-called Golden Age of Athens, a time of great culture, peace and prosperity, lasted a mere 50 years. 
Even before the birth of Christ, Greece was defeated by the Romans and then incorporated for centuries into the Roman Empire. In the 14th century, Greeks were conquered by the Serbs and in the 15th century by the Turks. Greece remained part of the Ottoman Empire for some 400 years, which certainly helps explain the high level of animosity between these two countries down to the present day. The most impressive thing about Delphi is its breathtaking setting on Mount Parnassus. The site is best known for Pythia, the ancient oracle. She was consulted before major undertakings such as going to war or establishing new colonies. Delphi was thought by the ancient Greeks to be the navel or center of the earth and is marked by a large marble monument known as the Omphalos. The most important of the many monuments here is the Temple of Apollo, once worshipped as the god of light, healing, music, and poetry. The ruins visible today are actually of the sixth Temple of Apollo on this site. It was destroyed at the end of the 4th century by Roman Emperor Theodosius I in the name of Christianity. The high priestess of the Temple of Apollo was Pythia, who served as the oracle. She is mentioned by all classical authors, including Aristotle, Plato, and Sophocles. Some describe her as speaking gibberish in a state of intoxication, while others have her speaking in elaborate poetic verses. A close inspection of some of the walls reveal ancient Greek writing etched into the stones. Delphi's Archaeological Museum has a scale model showing what the temple complex looked like thousands of years ago. The museum exhibits a wealth of impressive statues, sculpture, and other objects unearthed at the site. Greek ideals of beauty and balance are also linked to the notion of striving for a healthy mind in a healthy body. Greek food reflects a Mediterranean diet with lots of fresh fish, fruit, and vegetables. A Greek salad invariably includes a huge slab of goat cheese. Large numbers of visitors from Greece and abroad began coming to Delphi thousands of years ago to attend the athletic games and to consult the oracle. This has benefited the local hotels and restaurants that serve these visitors and afford stunning panoramic views. Greece is one of the most mountainous countries in Europe. Some 80% of the land consists of mountains and hills, which are visible from virtually everywhere. Thermopylae is where a vastly outnumbered Greek coalition army fought off Persian invaders for several critical days in 480 BC. I was changed to Thermopylae. It's where the sea was. 
Seas retreated. There's less water coming out of here as more has been used for agriculture. So we will attack. Form a hogshead, which is a triangular shaped phalanx, and advance towards Xerxes' banner. There are only 90,000 Persians between <laughs> us and victory. Meteora is a rock formation in central Greece that houses six monasteries from the 15th century that are still functioning. There were originally some two dozen of them, precipitously perched atop these inaccessible rock pillars. The monasteries provided natural protection for the hundreds of Eastern Orthodox monks and nuns who lived here during the four centuries of occupation by Turkish Muslims. An elaborate system of retractable rope ladders, baskets, and nets provided the necessary access for people, food, and other supplies. In the 1920s, steps were cut into the rock, making access easier. In the last century, roads were built to provide even easier access for residents and an increasing number of visitors. Today, fewer and fewer monks remain in these hilltop institutions, unlike their female counterparts whose numbers are stable. The Monastery of St. Stephen became a nunnery in 1961, and today is thriving with 28 nuns in residence. <laughs> The bustling city of Yanina enjoys a picturesque location on the banks of Lake Pomvotis, with a view of the snow-capped Pindus Mountains in the distance. The castle is certainly its most imposing historical structure. For most of its turbulent history, the city was an administrative center during the 500-year Turkish rule of the Ottoman Empire. The castle and its walls enclosed the fortified old town and included a palace, several mosques, a library, and the treasury. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, the thousand-year-old fortifications were reconstructed under the rule of Ali Pasha, an Albanian Ottoman, who gained considerable notoriety for ordering mass rapes, beheadings, and other atrocities. The beautiful island of Corfu is in the extreme northwestern corner of Greece, in the Ionian Sea just off the coast of southern Albania. It has played a key role throughout Greek mythology and history. Our hotel was in a 17th century mansion facing the main esplanade that runs along the edge of the old town promenade and its many bars and restaurants under the graceful Venetian colonnades is a popular meeting place for tourists and locals alike. A few miles outside of Corfu city is Achilleon, the summer palace of Austrian Empress Elizabeth of Bavaria. The beautiful and immensely popular monarch commonly known as Sissi, had the palace built in 1890. In what struck me as a lavish monument to bad taste, the palace was designed in the Pompeian style and filled with classically themed paintings and statues, many depicting the tragic Greek hero Achilles. The lavish gardens feature heroic scenes from the Trojan War including a statue of dying Achilles. The main hall contains a panoramic fresco, the triumph of Achilles, where he is shown standing on his chariot and dragging Hector's dead body in front of the gates of Troy. Sissi herself met a violent end in Geneva, 
where she was stabbed to death by an Italian anarchist in 1898. Corfu's Spianada Square is one of the largest in Europe. We were fortunate to be there on March 25th, Greek Independence Day. The day marks the successful 12-year war of independence against the Ottoman Empire. This Greek revolution ended 400 years of Turkish rule and established the modern Greek nation, internationally recognized in 1830. It is celebrated much like our 4th of July, with lots of patriotism, flags, balloons, parades of marching bands, and uniformed school children. During the 400 years that Venetians ruled Corfu, they built two huge fortresses strong enough to withstand several major Ottoman sieges. The so-called Old Fortress sits on an artificial island that was created by digging a moat around massive fortifications. Formerly known as Corcura, it was the site of some major battles with a navy that once rivaled those of Athens and Corinth. Corfu was ruled by Venetian nobility until the end of the 18th century, and traces of their reign can be found throughout the city. The Garden of Heroes in Missolonghi is a memorial to the thousands of civilians who were massacred or enslaved by Ottoman soldiers during the Greek Revolution in the 1820s. The graceful Rio Anterior Bridge crosses the Gulf of Corinth near Patras. Almost two miles in length, this engineering masterpiece is one of the longest multi-span cable-stayed bridges in the world. It was completed in 2004 and is designed to survive heavy tremors in this earthquake-prone region. Olympia is a small town on the eastern coast of the Peloponnese, the large peninsula south of the Greek mainland. Today, billions of people around the world associate the name Olympia with the athletic games that began here almost 3,000 years ago. In ancient Greece, the current archaeological site was a sanctuary with temples devoted to the principal Greek gods. Zeus was worshipped as the king of the gods. Hera, his sister and wife, was queen of the gods and worshipped as the goddess of women. The athletic games began here in the 8th century BC and continued in one form or another for another thousand years, well into the period of the Roman Empire. The last Olympic festival took place around 400 AD before the ruling Christians banned all pagan festivals. They began destroying the temples which later suffered further damage from earthquakes and tsunamis. Many of the sporting events at the ancient Olympic Games took place in the stadium. 
The track was some 212 meters long and made of hard-packed clay. The starting blocks were made of stone and are a popular attraction for today's visitors to the track. Many excavations began here in the late 19th century, principally by German archaeologists. In addition to the temples, other buildings that have been excavated include athletic stadiums, bathhouses, gymnasiums, offices, treasuries, shops, and other commercial buildings. Thousands of stone statues and other objects found here, made of bronze and ceramic, are displayed in museums around the world. Love in the morning, love in the afternoon, love in the evening. Love, 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 love. And you would know the most beautiful woman in the world. All the gods look at Paris and say, well, who are you going to choose? Do it quickly. <laughs> and Paris, without even hesitating for one tenth of a second, instantly picks up the, the golden apple and hands it to Aphrodite. Corinth was one of the most important cities in ancient Greece. Towering above it are the ruins of the mighty fortress of Acro-Corinth. At its highest peak was a temple to Aphrodite that was later replaced by a church and then a mosque. The archaeological museum has a fine collection of Greek, Roman, Jewish and Byzantine artifacts. The small statues of diseased or injured body parts were found near the temple of Asclepius, the god of medicine. A model of the part of the body which has suffered. For instance, you can see here a collection of legs. In the second century BC, the Romans demolished the Greek city and later built a new one on the same spot a century later. This is where the Apostle Paul visited on several occasions. He worked here as a tent maker for 18 months around the year 50 AD and regularly attended the synagogue. Two important letters he wrote to the small Corinthian community of Christian Jews and Gentiles later became part of the New Testament. There is one path in the middle of the winery. We will go through the winery. Under in our uh, huge cellar, and we will be in the, ta the tasting room to taste some uh, good wines. I hope they have good wine. And 450 bottles from 62 countries, the best in the world, 2013, we go in the competition and we get what? Why am I saying the story? Palmidi Castle overlooks the picturesque city of Nafplio. This area has been inhabited since ancient times, but little remains from classical antiquity. Like so many towns around the Mediterranean Rim, the city has a very checkered history. During the Middle Ages, it belonged successively to the Byzantines, the Franks, the Venetians, and the Turks. In the 19th century, Nafplio figured prominently during the Greek War of Independence. For over a dozen years, it was the capital of the First Hellenic Republic, 
and subsequently the first capital of the Kingdom of Greece. During most of its troubled history, Greece suffered under foreign domination. The first Greek king was actually a German teenager. He was born Prince Otto Friedrich Ludwig of the Bavarian Wittelsbach dynasty. In 1834, the 19-year-old king wisely moved the capital from Nafplio to Athens. He reigned there for some 30 years until he was deposed in 1862 and returned home to Bavaria. The impressive theatre at Epidaurus is one of the finest amphitheatres to be found anywhere. In ancient times, it was part of the healing centre associated with Asclepius, the god of medicine. Watching dramatic works, especially in such a picturesque natural setting, was believed to provide relief from physical and mental ailments. It was originally built with 32 rows. An additional 21 were added in Roman times. The theater, which seats 14,000 spectators, is renowned for its amazing acoustics. It's still used today for popular theatrical and musical performances. A thousand years before the Acropolis was built in Athens during Greece's so-called Golden Age, Mycenae was the hilltop capital of a flourishing ancient Greek civilization. The famous Lion's Gate is the only known monumental sculpture of Bronze Age Greece. Historians are still unclear as to who these Bronze Age Mycenaeans actually were, where they came from, or what happened to them. After winning the Trojan War, Mycenae became the leading power that dominated the entire Aegean region. When they suddenly disappeared around 1100 BC, the city of Mycenae was burned, abandoned, and Greece was plunged into four centuries of what is known as the Dark Ages. As is customary on such group tours, we stopped at a factory outlet that produces and sells expensive souvenirs. I've never really understood how they managed to stay in business, since there had never seemed to be many customers buying pottery, jewelry, or rugs in these huge stores. As we approach our second night in Nafplio, I'm very aware that we will soon be at the end of our Greek trip. Since my last visit to Greece was over 50 years ago, it seems unlikely that I'll be back here anytime soon. The stunning beauty of this country, with its snow-capped mountains, historic sites, beaches, islands, and waterfront vistas, contrasts sharply with its high unemployment and sputtering economy. Is this Greece? Okay, this is Greece. After a failed attempt some 2,000 years ago, the four-mile-long Corinth Canal was finally built over a dozen years at the end of the 19th century. Today, it's used mainly for tourist traffic. For our last day in Greece, we are back in the gritty, graffiti-covered capital of Athens. Much of the day was spent in the National Archaeological Museum admiring the magnificent artwork in what is certainly the finest collection of Greek art to be found anywhere in the world. The Greece that I remember from my trip here in 1960 is not really that different from the country I experienced in 2017. The grimy city of Athens, the archaeological sites at Delphi and elsewhere, the snow-capped mountains, beautiful seaside cities and the medieval hilltop fortresses have not changed appreciably in the intervening 57 years since my last visit. It is I who seem to have changed more during the past six decades than has Greece. In addition to being at a completely different stage in my life, I was far better prepared for this recent trip 
with a lifetime of absorbing books, films, and travels, in addition to life experiences. In a sense, I was a completely different person and much better able to appreciate the sights that presented themselves to me. Of course, diverse people may have totally different visits to the same country. Many visitors to Greece spend their time in one of the numerous island resorts, enjoying the sunny beaches and socializing or partying in the evenings. Our group tour focused mainly on some of the more spectacular sites from classical antiquity, the temple ruins, the theaters and artwork uncovered from thousands of years ago. The trip forced me to reflect on the passage of time. My perception of how long or short a decade feels has changed radically since I was a teenager. Having now lived for three quarters of a century has also changed my perception of that unit of time, which has shrunk enormously. Despite my greater knowledge and enjoyment of history, I am still perplexed by the seemingly contrary aspects of human activities that are so clearly reflected in these ancient civilizations. People in Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas have created beautiful statues and other works of art, along with impressive temples, churches, amphitheaters, palaces, bridges, canals, and other projects. At the same time, these civilizations have also engaged in an almost perpetual state of warfare, trying to enslave, kill, or otherwise dominate their neighbors. To counteract this negative force, we need to meet these foreigners, listen to their music, taste their food, learn their language, study their history, and interact with them through trade and travel. We left Greece having thoroughly enjoyed some unforgettable sights as well as some memorable insights. Oh.